Thank you for listening to our audiobooks. We do our best to regularly upload quality books with clear narrations. Please subscribe to our channel and click the notification bell icon so we can bring you more great books. Thank you very much and enjoy your audiobook. Chapter 8 Tricky Woo A Judge of Form I had spent a cold morning out in the fields and I had just one appointment left. As the road climbed, I began to see the church tower and roofs of Darraby, and at last, on the edge of the town, the gates of Mrs. Pumphrey's beautiful home lay beckoning. I looked at my watch. Twelve noon. Long practice had enabled me to time my visits here just before lunch, when I could escape the rigours of country practice and wallow for a little while in the hospitality of the elderly widow who had brightened my life for so long. As my tyres crunched on the gravel of the drive, I smiled as Tricky Woo appeared at the window to greet me. He was old now, but he could still get up there to his vantage point, and his Pekingese face was split, as always, by a grin of welcome. Mounting the steps between the twin pillars of the doorway, I could see that he had left the window and I heard his joyous barking in the hall. Ruth, the long-serving maid, answered my ring, beaming with pleasure, as Tricky flung himself at my knees. He is glad to see you, Miss Harriet, she said, and laying a hand on my arm. We all are. She ushered me into the gracious drawing room where Mrs. Pumphrey was sitting in an armchair by the fire. She raised her white head from her book and cried out in delight. Ah, Mr. Harriet, how very, very nice. Tricky, isn't it wonderful to have Uncle Harriet visiting again? She waved me to the armchair opposite. I have been expecting you for Tricky's checkup. But before you examine him, you must sit down and warm yourself. It is so terribly cold. Ruth, my dear, will you bring Mr. Harriet a glass of sherry? You will say yes, won't you, Mr. Harriet? I murmured my thanks. I always said yes to the very special sherry which came in enormous glasses and was deeply heartening at all times, but on cold days in particular. I sank into the cushions and stretched my legs towards the flames which leapt in the fireplace. And as I took my first sip, and Ruth deposited a plate of tiny biscuits by my side while the little dog climbed onto my knee, I felt completely at home. Tricky has been awfully well since your last visit, Mr. Harriet, Mrs. Pumphrey said. I know he is always going to be a little stiff with his arthritis, but he does get around so well, and his little heart cough is no worse. And best of all, she clasped her hands together and her eyes widened, he hasn't gone flop bot at all. Not once. So perhaps you won't have to squeeze the poor darling. Oh, no, I won't. Certainly not. I only do that if he really needs it. I had been squeezing Tricky Woo's bottom for many years because of his anal gland trouble, so graphically named by his mistress, and the little animal had never resented it. I stroked his head as Mrs. Pumphrey went on. There is something very interesting I must tell you. As you know, Tricky has always been deeply knowledgeable about horse racing, a wonderful judge of form, and wins nearly all his beds. Well, now. She raised a finger and spoke in a confidential murmur. Just recently, he has become very interested in greyhound racing. Is that so? Yes, indeed. He has begun to cover the meetings at the Middlesbrough Greyhound Track and has instructed me to place bets for him. And you know... He has won quite a lot of money already. Gosh! Yes! Only this morning, Crowther, my chauffeur, collected twelve pounds from the bookmaker after last evening's races. Well, well, how wonderful! My heart bled for Joe Downs, the local turf accountant who must be suffering after losing money on horse racing to a dog for years and then having to pay out on the greyhounds too. Quite remarkable. Isn't it? Isn't it? Mrs. Pumphrey gave me a radiant smile. Then she became serious. But I do wonder, Mr. Harriet, just what is responsible for this new interest. What is your opinion? I shook my head gravely. Difficult to say. Very difficult. However, I have a theory, she said. Do you think, perhaps, that as he grows older, he is more drawn to animals of his own species and prefers to bet on doggy runners like greyhounds? Could be. Could be. 
And, after all, you would think, with this affinity, it would give him more insight and a better chance of winning. Well, yes, that's possible. That's another point. Tricky, well aware that we were talking about him, waved his fine tail and looked up at me with his wide grin and lolling tongue. I settled deeper in the cushions as the sherry began to send warm tendrils through my system. This was a happily familiar situation, listening to Mrs. Pumphrey's recitals of Tricky Woo's activities. She was a kind, highly intelligent and cultivated lady, admired by all and a benefactress to innumerable charities. She sat on committees, and her opinion was sought on many important matters, but where her dog was concerned, her conversation never touched on weighty topics, but was filled with strange and wondrous things. She leant forward in her chair. There is something else I would like to talk to you about, Mr. Harriet. You know that a Chinese restaurant has set up in Darby? Yes, very nice too. She laughed. But who would have thought it? A Chinese restaurant in a little place like Darby. It's amazing. Very unexpected, I agree. But this last year or two, they've been popping up all over Britain. Yes, but what I want to discuss with you is that this has affected Tricky. What? Yes, he has been most upset over the whole business. How on earth... Well, Mr. Harriet, she frowned and gazed at me, solemn-faced. I told you many years ago, and you have always known, that Tricky is descended from a long line of Chinese emperors. Well, yes, yes, of course. Well, I think I can explain the whole problem if I start at the beginning. I took a long swallow at my sherry with the pleasant sensation that I was floating away in a dream world. Please do. When the restaurant first opened, she went on, there was a surprising amount of resentment among some of the local people. They criticised the food and the very nice little Chinese man and his wife and put it about that there was no place for such a restaurant in Danaby and that it should not be patronised. Now, it so happened that when Tricky and I were out on our little walks, he overheard these remarks in the street and he was furious. Really? Yes, quite affronted. I can tell when he feels like this. He stalks about with an insulted expression, and it is so difficult to placate him. Dear me, I'm sorry. And after all, one can fully understand how he felt when he heard his own people being denigrated. Quite. Quite, absolutely. Only natural. However, however, Mr. Harriet, she raised a finger again and gave me a knowing smile. The clever darling suggested the cure himself. He did? Yes. He told me that we ourselves should start to frequent the restaurant and sample their food. Ah! And that is what we did. I had Crowther drive us there for lunch, and we did enjoy it so much. Also, we found we could take the food home all nice and hot in little boxes. <laughs> what fun! Now that we have started, Crowther often pops out in the evening and brings us our supper, and you know... The restaurant seems quite busy now. I feel we have really helped. Well, I'm sure you have, I said. And I meant it. The lotus garden, tucked in a corner of the marketplace, wasn't much more than a shop front with four small tables inside, and the sight of the gleaming black length of the limousine and uniformed chauffeur parked frequently at its door must have given it a tremendous lift. I was struggling unsuccessfully to picture the locals peering through the window at Mrs. Pumphrey and Tricky eating at one of those tiny tables when she went on. I'm so glad you think so, and we've enjoyed it so much. Tricky adores the char suey, and my favourite is the chow mein. The little Chinese man is teaching us how to use the chopsticks too. I put down my empty glass and dusted the tasty biscuit crumbs from my jacket. I hated to interrupt these sessions and return to reality, but I looked at my watch. I am so glad things turned out so nicely, Mrs. Pumphrey, but I think I'd better give the little chap his check-up. I lifted Tricky onto a chair and palpated his abdomen thoroughly. Nothing wrong there. Then I fished out my stethoscope and listened to his heart and lungs. There was the heart murmur I knew about and some faint bronchitic sounds which I expected. In fact, I was totally familiar with all my old friend's internal workings after treating him over the years. Teeth now. Maybe could do with another scale next time. 
eyes with the beginnings of the lens opacity of the old dog, but not too bad at all. I turned to Mrs. Pumphrey. Tricky had tablets for his arthritis and the bronchitis, but I never elaborated on his ailments to her. Too many medical terms upset her. He's really wonderful for his age, Mrs. Pumphrey. You have his tablets to use when necessary, and you know where I am if ever you need me. Just one thing. You have been very good with his diet lately, so don't give him too many titbits. Not even extra char sui. She giggled and gave me a roguish look. Oh, please don't scold me, Mr. Harriet. I promise I'll be good. She paused for a moment. I must mention one more thing with regard to Tricky's arthritis. You know that Hodgkin has been throwing rings for him for years. Yes, I do. Her words raised an image of the dour old gardener under duress, casting the rubber rings on the lawn while the little dog, barking in delight, brought them back to him again. Hodgkin, who clearly didn't like dogs, invariably looked utterly fed up, and his lips always seemed to be moving as he muttered either to himself or Tricky. Well, I thought in view of Tricky's condition that Hodgkin was throwing the rings too far, and I told him to throw them for just a few feet. The little darling would have just as much fun with much less exertion. I see. Unfortunately, here her expression became disapproving. Hodgkin has been rather mean about it. In what way? I wouldn't have known anything about it, she said, lowering her voice. But Tricky confided in me. Did he really? Yes. He told me that Hodgkin had complained bitterly that it meant he had to bend down a lot more often to pick up the rings, and that he had arthritis too. But I wouldn't have minded. Her voice sank to a whisper. But Tricky was deeply shocked. He said Hodgkin used the word bloody several times. Oh dear, dear. Yes, I see the difficulty. It has made the whole thing so embarrassing for Tricky. What do you think I should do? I nodded sagely, and after some cogitation, gave my opinion. I do think, Mrs. Pumphrey, that it would be a good idea to have the throwing sessions less often and for a shorter time. After all, both Tricky and Hodgkin are no longer young. She gazed at me for a few moments, then smiled fondly. Oh, thank you, Mr. Harriet. I'm sure you are right, as always. I shall follow your advice. I looked back as I drove away down the drive. Mrs. Pumphrey and Ruth were smiling and waving from the doorway. Tricky was back at his window, laughing his head off as he barked his farewell. The curtains moving with the wagging of his tail. My stomach glowed with sherry and savoury biscuits. Not for the first time I thanked Providence for the infinite variety of veterinary practice. Chapter 9 Herman, A Happy Ending Was there no peace in a vet's life? I wondered fretfully as I hurried my car along the road to Gilthorpe Village. Eight o'clock on a Sunday evening, and here I was trailing off to visit a dog ten miles away, which, according to Helen, who had taken the message, had been ailing for more than a week. When I left Darraby, the streets of the little town were empty in the gathering dusk, and the houses had that tight-shut, comfortable look, which raised images of armchairs and pipes and firesides. And now, as I saw the lights of the farms winking on the fell sides, I could picture the stocksmen dozing contentedly with their feet up. I had not passed a single car on the darkening road. There was nobody out but Harriet. I was really sloshing around in my trough of self-pity when I drew up outside a row of greystone cottages at the far end of Gilthorpe. Mrs. Cundell, number four, Chestnut Row, Helen had written on the slip of paper, and as I opened the gate and stepped through the tiny strip of garden, my mind was busy with half-formed ideas of what I was going to say. My few years' experience in practice had taught me that it did no good at all to remonstrate with people for calling me out at unreasonable times. I knew perfectly well that my words never seemed to get through to them, and that they would continue to do exactly as they had done before, 
but for all that I had to say something if only to make me feel better. No need to be rude or ill-mannered, just a firm statement of the position. That vets like to relax on Sunday evenings just like other people. That we did not mind at all coming out for emergencies, but that we did object to having to visit animals which had been ill for a week. I had my speech fairly well prepared when a little middle-aged woman opened the door. Good evening, Mrs. Cundle, I said, slightly tight-lipped. Oh, it's Mr. Harriet. She smiled shyly. We've never met, but I've seen you walking around Darby on market days. Come inside. The door opened straight into the little low-beamed living room, and my first glance took in the shabby furniture and some pictures framed in tarnished gilt when I noticed that the end of the room was partly curtained off. Mrs. Cundle pulled the curtain aside. In a narrow bed, a man was lying, a skeleton thin man whose eyes looked up at me from hollows in a yellowed face. This is my husband, Ron, she said cheerfully, and the man smiled and raised a bony arm from the quilt in greeting. And here is your patient, Herman, she went on, pointing to a little dachshund who sat by the side of the bed. Herman? Yes. We thought it was a good name for a German sausage dog. They both laughed. Of course, I said. Excellent name. He looks like a Herman. The little animal gazed up at me, bright-eyed and welcoming. I bent down and stroked his head, and the pink tongue flicked over my fingers. I ran my hand over the glossy skin. He looks very healthy. What's the trouble? Oh, he's fine in himself, Mrs. Cundle replied. Eats well and everything, but over the last week he's been going funny on his legs. We weren't all that worried, but tonight he sort of flopped down and couldn't get up again. I see. I noticed he didn't seem keen to rise when I patted his head. I put my hand under the little dog's body and gently lifted him onto his feet. Come on, lad, I said. Come on, Herman, let's see you walk. As I encouraged him, he took a few hesitant steps, but his hind end swayed progressively, and he soon dropped into the sitting position again. It's his back, isn't it? Mrs. Cundle said. He's strong enough in his forelegs. That's my trouble, too, Ron murmured in a soft, husky voice. But he was smiling, and his wife laughed and patted the arm on the quilt. I lifted the dog onto my knee. Yes, the weakness is certainly in the back. I began to palpate the lumbar vertebrae, feeling my way along, watching for any sign of pain. Has he hurt himself? Mrs. Cundle asked. Has somebody hit him? We don't usually let him out alone, but sometimes he sneaks out through the garden gate. There's always the possibility of an injury, I said. But there are other causes. There were indeed a host of unpleasant possibilities. I didn't like the look of this little dog at all. This syndrome was one of the things I hated to encounter in canine practice. Can you tell me what you really think? She said. I'd like to know. Well, an injury could cause hemorrhage or concussion or edema. That's fluid, all affecting his spinal cord. He could even have a fractured vertebra, but I don't think so. And how about the other causes? Well, there's quite a lot. Tumours, bony growths, abscesses, or discs compress on the cord. Discs? Yes, little pads of cartilage and fibrous tissue between the vertebrae. In long-bodied dogs like Herman, they sometimes protrude into the spinal canal. In fact, I think that is what's causing his symptoms. Ron's husky voice came again from the bed. And what's his prospects, Mr. Elliot? No, oh, that was the question. Complete recovery or incurable paralysis? It could be anything. Very difficult to say at this moment, I said. I'll give him an injection and some tablets and we'll see how he goes over the next few days. I injected an analgesic and some antibiotic and kited out some salicylate tablets into a box. We had no steroids at that time. It was the best I could do. Now then, Mr. Elliot, Mrs. Cundle smiled at me eagerly. Ron has a bottle of beer every night about this time. Would you like to join him? Well, it's very kind of you, but I don't want to intrude. Oh, you're not doing that. We're glad to see you. She poured two glasses of brown ale, propped her husband up with pillows, and sat down by the bed. We're from South Yorkshire, Mr. Elliot, she said. I nodded. I had noticed the difference from the local accent. Aye. We come up here after Ron's accident eight years ago. 
What was that? I were a miner, Ron said. Roof fell in on me. I got a broken back, crushed liver, and a lot of other internal injuries, but two of me mates were killed in the same fall, so I'm lucky to be here. He sipped his beer. I've survived. But doctor says I'll never walk no more. I'm terribly sorry. Nay, nay, the husky voice went on. I count me blessings, and I've got a lot to be thankful for. I suffer very little, and I've got best wife in the world. Mrs. Candle laughed. Oh, listen to him. But I'm right glad we came to Gilthorpe. We used to spend all our holidays in the Dales. We were great walkers, and it was lovely to get away from the smoke and the chimneys. The bedroom in our old house just looked out on a lot of brick walls. But Ron has this big window right by him, and you can see for miles. Yes, of course, I said. This is a lovely situation. The village was perched on a high ridge on the fell side, and that window would command a wide view of the green slopes running down to the river and climbing high to the wildness of the moor on the other side. This sight had beguiled me so often on my rounds, and the grassy paths climbing among the airy tops seemed to beckon to me, but they would beckon in vain to Ron Candle. Getting Herman was a good idea too, he said. I used to feel a bit lonely when Mrs. went into Darby for shopping, but the little fellas made all the difference. You're never alone when you've got a dog. I smiled. How right you are. What's his age now, by the way? He's six, Ron replied. Right in the prime of life, aren't you, old lad? He let his arm fall by the bedside and his hand fondled the sleek ears. That seems to be his favourite place. Ah, it's a funny thing, but he always sits there. Mrs. is the one who has to take him walks and feed him, but he's very faithful to me. He has a basket over there, but this is his place. I only have to reach down and he's there. This was something that I had seen on many occasions with disabled people, that their pets stayed close by them, as if conscious of their role of comforter and friend. I finished my beer and got to my feet. Ron looked up at me. Reckon I'll spin mine out a bit longer. He glanced at his half-full glass. I used to shift about six pints some nights when I was out with lads. But, you know, I enjoy this one bottle just as much. Strange how things turn out. His wife bent over him, mock scolding. Yes, you've had to write your ways. You're a reformed character, aren't you? They both laughed as though it were a stock joke between them. Well, thank you for the drink, Mrs. Candle. I'll look in to see Herman on Tuesday. I moved towards the door. As I left, I waved to the man in the bed and his wife put her hand on my arm. We're very grateful to you for coming out at this time on a Sunday night, Mr. Elliot. We felt awful about calling you, but you understand it was only today that the little chap started going off his legs like that. Oh, of course, of course. Please don't worry. I didn't mind in the least. And as I drove through the darkness, I knew that I didn't mind. Now. My petty irritation had evaporated within two minutes of my entering that house, and I was left only with a feeling of humility. If that man back there had a lot to be thankful for, how about me? I had everything. I only wished I could dispel the foreboding I felt about his dog. There was a hint of doom about those symptoms of Herman's, and yet I knew I just had to get him right. On Tuesday he looked much the same, possibly a little worse. I think I'd better take him back to the surgery for X-ray, I said to Mrs. Candle. He doesn't seem to be improving with the treatment. I had no need to anaesthetise him or sedate him when I placed him on our newly acquired X-ray machine. Those hindquarters stayed still all by themselves. A lot too still for my liking. I was no expert in interpreting X-ray pictures, but at least I could be sure there was no fracture of the vertebrae. Also, there was no sign of bony ecstoses, but I thought I could detect a narrowing of the space between a couple of the vertebrae, which would confirm my suspicions of a protrusion of a disc. I could do nothing more than continue with my treatment and hope. By the end of the week, hope had grown very dim. I had supplemented the salicylates with long-standing remedies like tincture of Nux vomica and other ancient stimulant drugs, but when I saw Herman on the Saturday, he was unable to rise. I tweaked the toes of his hind limbs and was rewarded by a faint reflex movement, but with a sick certainty I knew the complete posterior paralysis was not far away. 
A week later, I had the unhappy experience of seeing my prognosis confirmed in the most classical way. When I entered the door of the Cundall's cottage, Herman came to meet me, happy and welcoming in his front end, but dragging his hind legs helplessly behind him. Hello, Mr. Arias. Mrs. Cundall gave me a wan smile and looked down at the little creature stretched frog-like on the carpet. What do you think of him now? I bent and tried the reflexes. Nothing. I shrugged my shoulders, unable to think of anything to say. I looked at the gaunt figure in the bed, the arm outstretched as always on the quilt. Good morning, Ron, I said as cheerfully as I could. But there was no reply. The face was averted, looking out of the window. I walked over to the bed. Ron's eyes were staring fixedly at a glorious panorama of moor and fell, at the pebbles of the river, white in the early sunshine, at the crisscross of the grey walls against the green. His face was expressionless. It was as though he did not know I was there. I went back to his wife. I don't think I have ever felt more miserable. Is he annoyed with me? I whispered. No, no, no. It's this. She held out a newspaper. It's upset him something awful. I looked at the printed page. There was a large picture at the top, a picture of a dachshund exactly like Herman. This dog, too, was paralysed, but its hind end was supported by a little four-wheeled bogey. On the picture it appeared to be sporting with his mistress. In fact, it looked quite happy and normal, except for those wheels. Ron seemed to hear the rustle of the paper because his head came round quickly. What do you think of that, Miss Harriet? Do you agree with it? Well, I don't really know, Ron. I don't like the look of it, but I suppose the lady in the picture thought it was the only thing to do. Aye, maybe. The husky voice trembled. But I don't want Herman to finish up like that. The arm dropped by the side of the bed and his fingers felt around on the carpet. But the little dog was still splayed out near the door. It's hopeless now, mysterious, isn't it? Well, it was a black lookout from the beginning, I said. These cases are so difficult. I'm very sorry. Nay, I'm not blaming you, he said. You've done what you could. Same as vet for that dog in the picture did what he could. But it was no good, was it? What do we do now? Put him down? No, Ron, forget about that just now. Sometimes paralysis cases just recover on their own after many weeks. But we must carry on. At this moment, I honestly cannot say there is no hope. I paused for a moment, then turned to Mrs. Cundall. One of the problems is the dog's natural functions. You'll have to carry him out into the garden for that. Oh, of course, of course, she replied. I'll do anything. As long as there's some hope. There is. I assure you there is. But on the way back to the surgery, the thought hammered in my brain. That hope was very slight. Spontaneous recovery did sometimes occur, but Herman's condition was extreme. I repressed the groan as I thought of the nightmarish atmosphere which had begun to surround my dealings with the Cundles. The paralysed man and the paralysed dog. And why did that picture have to appear in the paper just at this very time? Every veterinary surgeon knows the feeling that fate has loaded the scales against him, and it weighed on me, despite the bright sunshine spreading into the car. However, I kept going back every few days. Sometimes I took a couple of bottles of brown ale along in the evening and drank them with Ron. He and his wife were always cheerful, but the little dog never showed the slightest sign of improvement. He still had to pull his useless hind limbs after him when he came to greet me, and though he always returned to his station by his master's bed, nuzzling up into Ron's hand, I was beginning to resign myself to the certainty that one day that arm would come down from the quilt and Herman would not be there. It was on one of these visits that I noticed an unpleasant smell as I entered the house. There was something familiar about it. I sniffed, and the Cundles looked at each other guiltily. There was a silence, and then Ron spoke. It's some medicine I've been giving Herman. Stinks like hell, but it's supposed to be good for dogs. Oh, yes? Aye, well... His fingers twitched uncomfortably on the bedclothes. It was Bill Noakes put me onto it. He's an old mate of mine. 
We used to work down pit together, and he came to visit me last weekend. He keeps a few whippets, does Bill. Knows a lot about dogs, and he sent me this stuff along for Herman. Mrs. Candle went to the cupboard and sheepishly presented me with a plain bottle. I removed the cork, and as the horrid stench rose up to me, my memory became suddenly clear. Asafetida, a common constituent of quack medicines before the war, and still lingering on the shelves of occasional chemist shops, and in the medicine chests of people who like to doctor their own animals. I had never prescribed the stuff myself, but it was supposed to be beneficial in horses with colic and dogs with digestive troubles. My own feeling had always been that its popularity had been due solely to the assumption that anything which stunk as badly as that must have some magical properties. But one thing I knew for sure was that it could not possibly do anything for Herman. I replaced the cork. So you're giving him this, eh? Ron nodded. Aye, three times a day. He doesn't like it much, but Bill Noakes has great faith in it. Cured hundreds of dogs with it, he says. The deep sunk eyes looked at me with a silent appeal. Well, fine, Ron, I said. You carry on. Let's hope he does a trick. I knew the asafetida couldn't do any harm, and since my treatment had proved useless, I was in no position to turn haughty. But my main concern was that these two nice people had been given a glimmer of hope, and I wasn't going to blot it out. Mrs. Candle smiled, and Ron's expression relaxed. Oh, that's grand, Mr. Elliot, he said. I'm glad you don't mind. I can dose the little fellow myself. It's summer for me to do. It was about a week after the commencement of the new treatment that I called in at the Candles as I was passing through Gilthorpe. How are you today, Ron? I asked. Champion, Mr. Elliot. Champion. He always said that, but today there was a new eagerness in his face. He reached down and lifted his dog onto the bed. Look here. He pinched the little paw between his fingers, and there was a faint but definite retraction of the leg. I almost fell over in my haste to grab at the other foot. The result was the same. My God, Ron! I gasped. The reflexes are coming back. He laughed his soft, husky laugh. Bill knows stuff. It's working, isn't it? A gush of emotions, mainly professional shame and wounded pride, welled in me, but it was only for a moment. Yes, Ron, I replied. It's working, no doubt about it. He stared up at me. Then Herman's going to be all right. Well, it's early days yet, but that's the way it looks to me. It was several weeks more before the little Dachshund was back to normal, and of course it was a fairly typical case of spontaneous recovery, with nothing whatever to do with the asafetida, or indeed with my own efforts. Even now, thirty years later, when I treat these puzzling back conditions with steroids, I wonder how many of them would have recovered without my aid. Quite a number, I imagine. Sadly, despite the modern drugs, we still have our failures. And I always regard a successful termination with profound relief. But that feeling of relief has never been stronger than it was with Herman, and I can recall vividly my final call at the cottage in Gilthorpe. As it happened, it was around the same time as my first visit, eight o'clock in the evening, and when Mrs. Candle ushered me in, the little dog bounded joyously up to me before returning to his post by the bed. Well, that's a lovely sight, I said. He can gallop like a racehorse now. Ron dropped his hand down and stroked the sleek head. Ah, isn't it grand? By heck, it's been a worrying time. Well, I'll be going. I gave Herman a farewell pat. I just looked in on my way home to make sure all was well. I don't need to come any more now. Nay, nay, Ron said. Don't rush off. You've time to have a bottle of beer with me before you go. I sat down by the bed, and Mrs. Candle gave us our glasses before pulling up a chair for herself. It was exactly like that first night. I poured my beer and looked at the two of them. Their faces glowed with friendliness, and I marvelled because my part in Herman's salvation had been anything but heroic. In their eyes, everything I had done must have seemed bumbling and ineffectual, and in fact, they must be convinced that all would have been lost if Ron's old chum from the coalface had not stepped in and effortlessly put things right. At best, they could only regard me as an amiable fathead. And all the explanations and protestations in the world would not alter that. 
But though my ego had been bruised, I didn't really care. I was witnessing a happy ending instead of a tragedy, and that was more important than petty self-justification. I made a mental resolve never to say anything which might spoil their picture of this triumph. I was about to take my first sip when Mrs. Cundell spoke up. This is your last visit, Mr. Elliot, and all's ended well. I think we ought to drink some sort of toast. I agree, I said. Let's see, what shall it be? Ah, oh, yes, I've got it. I raised my glass. Here's to Bill Noakes. Chapter 10 Brandy, the Dustbin Dog In the semi-darkness of the surgery passage, I thought it was a hideous growth dangling from the side of the dog's face. But as he came closer, I saw that it was only a condensed milk can. Not that condensed milk cans are commonly found sprouting from dog's cheeks, but I was relieved because I knew I was dealing with brandy again. I hoisted him onto the table. Brandy, you've been in the dustbin again. The big golden Labrador gave me an apologetic grin and did his best to lick my face. He couldn't manage it since his tongue was jammed inside the can, but he made up for it by a furious wagging of tail and rear end. Oh, Mr. Herriot, I am sorry to trouble you again. Mrs. Westby, his attractive young mistress, smiled ruefully. He just won't keep out of that dustbin. Sometimes the children and I get the cans off ourselves, but this one is stuck fast. His tongue is trapped under the lid. Yes. Yes, I eased my finger along the jagged edge of the metal. It's a bit tricky, isn't it? We don't want to cut his mouth. As I reached for a pair of forceps, I thought of the many other occasions when I had done something like this for Brandy. He was one of my patients, a huge, lolloping, slightly goofy animal. But this dustbin raiding was becoming an obsession. He liked to fish out a can and lick out the tasty remnants, but his licking was carried out with such sudden dedication that he burrowed deeper and deeper until he got stuck. Again and again he had been freed by his family or myself from fruit salad cans, corned beef cans, baked bean cans, soup cans... There didn't seem to be any kind of can he didn't like. I gripped the edge of the lid with my forceps and gently bent it back along its length till I was able to lift it away from the tongue. An instant later, that tongue was slobbering all over my cheek as Brandy expressed his delight and thanks. Get back, you daft dog, I said, laughing as I held the panting face away from me. Yes, come down, Brandy. Mrs. Westby hauled him from the table and spoke sharply. It's all very fine making a fuss now, but you're becoming a nuisance with this business. It will have to stop. The scolding had no effect on the lashing tail, and I saw that his mistress was smiling. You just couldn't help liking Brandy because he was a great ball of affection and tolerance without an ounce of malice in him. I had seen the Westby children, there were three girls and a boy, carrying him around by the legs, upside down, or pushing him in a pram, sometimes dressed in baby clothes. Those youngsters played all sorts of games with him, but he suffered them all with good humour. In fact, I'm sure he enjoyed them. Brandy had other idiosyncrasies, apart from his fondness for dustbins. I was attending the Westby cat at their home one afternoon when I noticed the dog acting strangely. Mrs. Westby was sitting knitting in an armchair while the oldest girl squatted on the hearth rug with me and held the cat's head. It was when I was searching my pockets for my thermometer that I noticed Brandy slinking into the room. He wore a furtive air as he moved across the carpet and sat down with studied carelessness in front of his mistress. After a few moments, he began to work his rear end gradually up the front of the chair towards her knees. Absently, she took a hand away from her knitting and pushed him down, but he immediately restarted his backward ascent. It was an extraordinary mode of progression, his hips moving in a very slow rumble rhythm as he elevated them inch by inch, and all the time the golden face was blank and innocent, as though nothing at all was happening. Fascinated, I stopped hunting for my thermometer and watched. Mrs. Westby was absorbed in an intricate part of her knitting, and didn't seem to notice that Brandy's bottom was now firmly part on her shapely knees, which were clad in blue jeans. The dog paused, as though acknowledging that phase one had been successfully completed. Then, ever so gently, he began to consolidate his position pushing his way up the front of the chair with his forelimbs, till at one time he was almost standing on his head. It was at that moment, just when one final backward heave would have seen the great dog ensconced on her lap, that Mrs. Westby finished the tricky bit of knitting and looked up. 
Oh, really, Brandy, you are silly. She put her hand on his rump and sent him slithering disconsolately to the carpet, where he lay and looked at her with liquid eyes. What was all that about? I asked. Mrs. Westby laughed. Oh, it's these old blue jeans. When Brandy first came here as a tiny puppy, I spent hours nursing him on my knee. And I used to wear the jeans a lot then. Ever since, even though he's a grown dog, the very sight of the things make him try to get on my knee. But he doesn't just jump up. Oh, no, she said. He's tried it. He knows perfectly well I can't have a huge Labrador in my lap. So now it's the stealthy approach, eh? She giggled. That's right. When I'm preoccupied, knitting or reading, sometimes he manages to get nearly all the way up. And if he's been playing in the mud, he makes an awful mess and I have to go and change. That's when he really does receive a scolding. A patient like Brandy added colour to my daily round. When I was walking my own dog, I often saw him playing in the fields by the river. One particularly hot day, many of the dogs were taking to the water either to chase sticks or just to cool off. But whereas they glided in and swam off sedately, Brandy's approach was unique. I watched as he ran up to the river bank, expecting him to pause before entering. But instead, he launched himself outwards, legs splayed in a sort of swallow dive, and hung for a moment in the air rather like a flying fox before splashing thunderously into the depth. To me, it was the action of a completely happy extrovert. On the following day in those same fields, I witnessed something even more extraordinary. There is a little children's playground in one corner. A few swings, a roundabout and a slide. Brandy was disporting himself on the slide. For this activity, he had assumed an uncharacteristic gravity of expression and stood calmly in the queue of children. When his turn came, he mounted the steps, slid down the metal slope, all dignity and importance, then took a staid walk round to rejoin the queue. The little boys and girls who were his companions seemed to take him for granted. But I found it difficult to tear myself away. I could have watched him all day. I often smiled to myself when I thought of Brandy's antics. But I didn't smile when Mrs. Westby brought him into the surgery a few months later. His bounding ebullience had disappeared, and he dragged himself along the passage to the consulting room. As I lifted him onto the table, I noticed that he had lost a lot of weight. Now, what is the trouble, Mrs. Westby? I asked. She looked at me worriedly. He's been off colour for a few days now, listless and coughing and not eating very well. But this morning he seems quite ill, and you can see he's starting to pant. Yes. Yes. As I inserted the thermometer, I watched the rapid rise and fall of the ribcage and noted the gaping mouth and anxious eyes. He does look very sorry for himself. His temperature was 104 degrees Fahrenheit. I took up my stethoscope. I have heard of an old Scottish doctor describing a seriously ill patient's chest as sounding like a Kister Wessels, and that just about described Brandy's. Wheezes, squeaks and bubblings, they were all there against the background of laboured respiration. I put the stethoscope back in my pocket. He's got pneumonia. Oh, dear. Mrs. Westby reached out and touched the heaving chest. That's bad, isn't it? Yes, I'm afraid so. But, she gave me an appealing glance. I understand it isn't so fatal since the new drugs came out. I hesitated. Yes, that's quite right. In humans and most animals, the sulphur drugs and now penicillin have changed the picture completely. But dogs are still very difficult to cure. Thirty years later, it is still the same. Even with all the armory of antibiotics which followed penicillin, streptomycin, the tetracyclines and synthetics, and the new non-antibiotic drugs and steroids, I still hate to see pneumonia in a dog. But you don't think it's hopeless? Mrs. Westby asked. No, 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 not at all. I'm just warning you that so many dogs don't respond to treatment when they should. But Brandy is young and strong. He must stand a fair chance. I wonder what started this off anyway. Oh, I think I know, Mr. Elliot. He had a swim in the river about a week ago. I tried to keep him out of the water in this cold weather, but if he sees a stick floating, he just takes a dive into the middle. You've seen him. It's one of the funny little things he does. Yes, I know. And was he shivery afterwards? He was. 
I walked him straight home, but it was such a freezing cold day. I could feel him trembling as I dried him down. I nodded. That would be the cause, all right. Anyway, let's start his treatment. I'm going to give him this injection of penicillin, and I'll call at your house tomorrow to repeat it. He's not well enough to come to the surgery. Very well, Mr. Harriet. Is there anything else? Yes, there is. I want you to make him what we call a pneumonia jacket. Cut two holes in an old blanket for his forelegs and stitch him into it along the back. You can use an old sweater if you like, but he must have his chest warmly covered. Only let him out in the garden for necessities. I called and repeated the injection on the following day. There wasn't much change. I injected him for four more days and the realisation came to me sadly that Brandy was like so many of the others. He wasn't responding. The temperature did drop a little, but he ate hardly anything and grew gradually thinner. As the days passed, he continued to cough and pant and to sink deeper into a blank-eyed lethargy. I was forced more and more to the conclusion, which a few weeks ago would have seemed impossible, that this happy, bounding animal was going to die. But Brandy didn't die. He survived. You couldn't put it any higher than that. His temperature came down and his appetite improved, and he climbed onto a plateau of twilight existence where he seemed content to stay. He isn't Brandy any more, Mrs. Westby said one morning a few weeks later when I called in. Her eyes filled with tears as she spoke. I shook my head. No, I'm afraid he isn't. Are you giving him the halibut liver oil? Yes, every day. But nothing seems to do him any good. Why is he like this, Miss Harriet? Well, he has recovered from a really virulent pneumonia, but it's left him with a chronic pleurisy, adhesions, and probably other kinds of lung damage. It looks as though he's just stuck there. She dabbed at her eyes. It breaks my heart to see him like this. He's only five, but he's like an old, old dog. He's so full of life too. She sniffed and blew her nose. When I think of how I used to scold him for getting into the dustbins and mudding up my jeans, how I wish he would do some of his funny old tricks now. I thrust my hands deep into my pockets. Never does anything like that now, eh? No, no, just hangs about the house. Doesn't even want to go for a walk. As I watched, the brandy rose from his place in the corner and pottered slowly over to the fire. He stood there for a moment, gaunt and dead-eyed, and he seemed to notice me for the first time because the end of his tail gave a brief twitch before he coughed, groaned, and flopped down on the hearthrug. Mrs. Westby was right. He was like a very old dog. Do you think he'll always be like this? she asked. I shrugged. We can only hope. But as I got into my car and drove away, I really didn't have much hope. I have seen calves with lung damage after bad pneumonias. They recovered, but were called bad doers because they remained thin and listless for the rest of their lives. Doctors too had plenty of chesty people on their books. They were more or less in the same predicament. Weeks and then months went by, and the only time I saw the Labrador was when Mrs. Westby was walking him on his lead. I always had the impression that he was reluctant to move. And his mistress had to stroll along very slowly so that he could keep up with her. The sight of him saddened me when I thought of the lolloping brandy of old, but I told myself that at least I'd saved his life. I could do no more for him now, and I made a determined effort to push him out of my mind. In fact, I tried to forget brandy and had managed to do so fairly well until one afternoon in February. On the previous night, I felt I had been through the fire. I had treated a colicky horse until 4 a.m., and was crawling into bed, comforted by the knowledge that the animal was settled down and free from pain, when I was called to a calving. I had managed to produce a large live calf from a small heifer, but the effort had drained the last of my strength, and when I got home, it was too late to return to bed. Plowing through the morning round, I was so tired that I felt disembodied, and at lunch, Helen watched me anxiously as my head nodded over my food. There were a few dogs in the waiting room at two o'clock, and I dealt with them mechanically, peering through half-closed eyelids. 
By the time I reached my last patient, I was almost asleep on my feet. In fact, I had the feeling that I wasn't there at all. Next, please, I mumbled as I pushed open the waiting room door and stood back waiting for the usual sight of a dog being led out to the passage. But this time there was a big difference. There was a man in the doorway, all right, and he had a little poodle with him. But the thing that made my eyes snap wide open was that the dog was walking upright on his hind limbs. I knew I was half asleep, but surely I wasn't seeing things. I stared down at the dog, but the picture hadn't changed. The little creature strutted through the doorway, chest out, head up, as erect as a soldier. Follow me, please, I said hoarsely and set off over the tiles to the consulting room. Halfway along, I just had to turn round to check the evidence of my eyes, and it was just the same. The poodle, still on his hind legs, marching along unconcernedly at his master's side. The man must have seen the bewilderment in my face, because he burst suddenly into a roar of laughter. Don't worry, Mr. Harriet, he said. This little dog was circus trained before I got him as a pet. I like to show off his little tricks. This one really startles people. You can say that again, I said breathlessly. He nearly gave me heart failure. The poodle wasn't ill, he just wanted his nails clipping. I smiled as I hoisted him onto the table and began to ply the clippers. I suppose he won't want his hind claws doing, I said. He'll have worn them down himself. I was glad to find I had recovered sufficiently to attempt a little joke. However, by the time I had finished, the old lassitude had taken over again, and I felt ready to fall down as I showed man and dog to the front door. I watched the little animal trotting away down the street, in orthodox manner this time, and it came to me suddenly that it had been a long time since I had seen a dog doing something unusual and amusing, like the things Brandy used to do. A wave of gentle memories flowed over me as I leant wearily against the doorpost and closed my eyes. When I opened them, I saw Brandy coming round the corner of the street with Mrs. Westby. His nose was entirely obscured by a large red tomato soup can, and he strained madly at the leash and whipped his tail when he saw me. It was certainly an hallucination this time. I was looking into the past. I really ought to go to bed immediately. But I was still rooted to the doorpost when the Labrador bounded up the steps, made an attempt, aborted by the soup can, to lick my face, and contented himself with cocking a convivial leg against the bottom step. I stared into Mrs. Westby's radiant face. What? What? With her sparkling eyes and wide smile, she looked more attractive than ever. Look, Mr. Harriet, look! He's better! He's better! In an instant, I was wide awake. And I... I suppose you'll want me to get that can off him. Oh, yes. Yes, please! It took all my strength to lift him onto the table. He was heavier now than before his illness. I reached for the familiar forceps and began to turn the jagged edges of the can outwards from the nose and mouth. Tomato soup must have been one of his favourites, because he was really deeply embedded, and it took some time before I was able to slide the can from his face. I fought off his slobbering attack. He's back in the dustbins, I see. Yes, he is. Quite regularly. I've pulled several cans off him myself. And he goes sliding with the children, too. She smiled happily. Thoughtfully, I took my stethoscope from the pocket of my white coat and listened to his lungs. They were wonderfully clear. A slight roughness here and there, but the old cacophony had gone. I leant on the table and looked at the great dog with a mixture of thankfulness and incredulity. He was, as before, boisterous and full of the joy of living. His tongue lolled in a happy grin, and the sun glinted through the surgery window on his sleek golden coat. But Mr. Harriet, Mrs. Westby's eyes were wide. How on earth has this happened? How has he got better? This, medicatrix, naturae, I replied in tones of deep respect. I beg your pardon? The healing power of nature. Something no veterinary surgeon can compete with when he decides to act. I see. And you can never tell when this is going to happen? Nope. For a few seconds we were silent as we stroked the dog's head, ears and flanks. Oh, by the way, I said, has he shown any renewed interest in the blue jeans? Oh, my word, yes. They're in the washing machine at this very moment, absolutely covered in mud. Isn't it marvellous?
We hope you've enjoyed Dog Stories by James Harriet. Text copyright 1995 by the James Harriet Partnership. Production copyright 1996 by Audio Renaissance, a division of Holtzbrink Publishers, LLC. All rights reserved. Thank you for listening to our audiobooks. We do our best to regularly upload quality books with clear narrations. Please subscribe to our channel and click the notification bell icon so we can bring you more great books. Thank you very much and we hope you enjoyed listening to your audiobook.